Welcome everyone. My name is Dana Pearls. I am the manager of Friends of the Earth's Emerging Tech Program. Um, we are recording the speakers and we will be turning off the recording for the Q&A, the questions and answers. Um, I encourage everyone to use the chat box early and often. And in addition to using the chat, please ask your questions or share your reflections in the Q&A. There's a bottom at the button of your screen that says Q&A and you can put questions there. And we will be answering questions um, at the end when all the panelists are done. Um, you'll also notice that we'll be sharing prompts in the chat in both English and Spanish. I'll do my best to translate some of the comments in the chat, but probably won't be translating everything. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our panelists. We'll be hearing from J.D. Hansen, who is the policy director with the Center for Food Safety, um, and Malaika Elias, who is a campaigner with Friends of the Earth, and Angel Garcia, who's the organizing director with Californians for Pesticide Reform. And so we'll be hearing about the risks and the concerns we'll be about this genetically engineered mosquito. We'll be hearing about some of the issues around regulations and um, about what this looks like on the ground. And just to ground us in what this actually is, we're gonna be speaking about a proposal by the California government to approve the release of Oxitec, a biotech company's um, genetically engineered mosquitoes. So the US EPA approved the release of 2 billion genetically engineered mosquitoes to be released by Oxitec in California. Specifically, the application was approved for four counties, but Oxitec has named Tulare County as its focus right now. If it is approved by California's Department of Pesticide Regulation, this British company, Oxitec, may release billions of experimental genetically engineered mosquitoes across Tulare County. Um, there's concern that these genetically engineered mosquitoes have not been properly studied and pose risks to people and the environment. So now we're going to hear more about what those concerns are, and then we'll have questions and answers at the end. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to J.D. Hansen. J.D., you're on mute. I just figured that out. <laughs> um, good evening. Nice to uh, be with you all this evening. Um, my first job is to tell you what this GE mosquito is um, uh, and, and who made it. Um, it's made by the British biotech company that's called Oxitec. Um, and what they've done for the second time now is genetically engineered Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Uh, uh, we know these better as the yellow fever mosquito. And they're engineered so the female larvae die. In theory, the proposed experiment would be to reduce the population of Aedes aegypti, one of the mosquito species that can carry viruses that cause yellow fever dinghy, chikungunya, and Zika. Um, none of these diseases, though, are endemic in California. There have been cases, but there are cases where mosquitoes bit somebody that came from somewhere else and spread it locally. They are um, somewhat um, endemic in Puerto Rico. That's the only part of the U.S. that they're uh, endemic. While limiting the spread of mosquito-borne disease is important, um, 
Once these GE mosquitoes are released into the wild, there's no calling them back. And scientists have raised important questions about the efficacy. Uh, first, will it, how well will it work? And then if it, if it works better than um, I think it will, uh, what, what are the potential uh, risks going to be in this open air experiment? Um, first, the, it won't work in that the, the females may survive. Um, it's not necessary. There are better solutions to control these mosquitoes. And it could backfire. Um, when the um, company released its earlier draft of, of, of the mosquito in Brazil, what scientists found was that they um, lived in the environment. They um, mated uh, with uh, wild mosquitoes, and they they survived. Um, now, this new version is supposed to be be designed to kill the female so that only male. GE mosquitoes survive and spread for multiple generations. Um, if they are successful at producing zero female mosquitoes uh, and, and make sure that the, the next generation dies off, um, will be a first. Um, Oxytex uh, GE mosquito was made from a, a wild, uh, mosquito strain uh, imported from Mexico. Its, uh, its genes uh, will spread in, in the population when it's released, uh, adding this new genetic component to the mosquitoes you already have in California. Um, scientists call this spread of genes introgression. And the degree of integration is likely to be significantly higher than the earlier strain due to the higher larval survival rates. And, um, and it's likely to be higher because of the huge number of mosquitoes they plan on releasing. Well, what does this mean for Tulare? Um, well, we, we have to worry about vector competence. That is, how well will a mosquito strain spread diseases? And this varies a lot. Um, will this uh, Mexican strain spread dinghy, chikungunya, or Zika more than the uh, current local strains? We don't know because it hasn't been tested for that. I think I'm on slide eight now. Um, the past uh, work that the company has done uh, is a series of misleading claims. Um, when they were doing work in the Cayman Islands, um, we, we were fortunate enough to get um, released uh, through Freedom of Information uh, data on what was happening, what the, the Cayman Island folks were saying, and um, what, what we found from the researchers in the Cayman Islands was that while Oxitec and the Monroe County Peter uh, Control District we're making you know, public statements uh, proclaiming major reductions in the Aedes Egyptian population in the treatment area. The data does not, did not support it. The data recorded showed no significant reduction in the abundance of Aedes aegypti in the release area. And there was a significant increase in the number of female uh, mosquitoes uh, corrected. In short, um, the Cayman Islands could have wasted a lot of money. 
had they decided to go to this, this route uh, to control the mosquitoes. Um, is it safe for humans and animals? Um, there will be a massive uh, releases of these mosquitoes in local environments. Um, what we expect is that, you know, there will be so many mosquitoes in some localities that you'll have to be careful not to breathe them in. The um, temporary drop in the wild Aedes aegypti population in the release area uh, will likely be followed by a rebound. We can move on to the next slide. The, a hybrid mosquito, uh, like the ones that developed in Brazil, could actually perpetuate the spread of more diseases. Hybrid mosquitoes may be more aggressive, more virulent, more resistant to insecticides, which could require more rain of other pesticides. Uh, it could because um, we don't fully know, and there are ways of testing this before the mosquito is released. I'm a big proponent of, of cage trials where you can, you can test these um, um, theories and, and not uh, test them with billions of mosquitoes in the wild. Um, big question, especially around Tulare, is will these GE mosquitoes survive in the environment? Uh, they can evolve resistance to the killing mechanism, which in this case, it's the, the killing mechanism is um, lack of tetracycline. They've been engineered to require tetracycline. When they don't get tetracycline, the females die. Um, well, you know, the, the problem is there's uh, all of these uh, citrus trees around um, the Tulare area are being sprayed with tetracycline now to control um, uh, the um, citrus green disease. Uh, all of the concentrated agriculture operations around uh, Tulare County also have a lot of tetracycline. So you have a lot of, a lot of the chemical that keeps the females alive will be there. The EPA says you have to make sure that there are um, 500 meters, but there are people that 500 meters from the, uh, the farms that are doing tetracycline, but, but there are people that are growing citrus in their own backyard. And some of them are already using tetracycline to treat citrus screening disease. So, you know, you can't, guarantee that there are, these mosquitoes aren't going to get it. Um, then one of the things that just gripes me when I read the, the EPA materials is that they have whited out or blacked out, they, the company, uh, lots of data. Um, one of the areas that they, they whited out was all the information on whether the, these new genes that people have never been exposed to before uh, cause allergic reactions or not. Um, all kinds of things are happening, you know, and um, I read the other day about a, a man who, who died of asthma from smoke inhalation. I have no idea what happens if you have fires, which California has a lot of, uh, combined with these uh, GE mosquitoes uh, toxins. So I, I, I think we have to uh, conclude that the only reason the EPA says that they can't call this allergenic or toxic is because they haven't adequately tested it to find out. How am I doing, Dana? You're doing great. Thanks, JD. Okay. 
All right. And if the uh, DE mosquitoes survive, or if they make the females in the environment more, more virulent, um, it can go out and, and spread these uh, uh, proteins uh, by biting you. Um, or if, if they're having so many as they, as they did in Brazil that you end up swallowing them, uh, the exposure can come that way. So there's a lot of questions that haven't been answered and uh, there are ways to do it by um, uh, testing some of these theories uh, in the lab and they didn't do that. So I, I hope the uh, California Department of of uh, pesticide regulation will uh, make the company go and do what the EPA didn't make them do. And I think that's a good lead into Malika's. Great, thanks JD. Hi everyone. Um, so one of the biggest concerns that we have in addition to those just mentioned by JD is that uh, we don't really have systems in place to be able to do experiments like this responsibly. Um, in particular, there's really no way to evaluate, monitor, or have oversight of this project because these important systems haven't been mandated by any regulatory body. Currently, the company Oxitec is basically monitoring and evaluating its own experiment. Um, there are no interdisciplinary scientific advisory panels to give uh, expert opinions on this experiment. The only people that are weighing in are scientists that work for Oxitec, which is extremely problematic. Um, because of this, the company is able to hide a lot of data and claim to be successful, even though their product hasn't been assessed properly by outside sources. And the unavailability of public data is especially concerning because Oxitex experiments may not even show whether they reduce the number of um, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, which would just make the experiment pointless. So despite the EPA's approval, um, there are no national or state regulations specific to genetically engineered insects. Um, GE insects are being forced into the pesticide category, but the regulations that govern pesticides are outdated and they're not very applicable to GE insects. Um, the lack of transparency with which Oxitec is operating regarding this public data is extremely concerning. As we mentioned before, um, critical information is being protected as something called confidential business information, um, which the public cannot access. And some of the key questions that need to be answered with research prior to the Department of Pesticide Regulation making a decision uh, include questions about the lab data that shows that females won't be released, the toxicity impacts, including data about allergies and what the impacts are from ingesting the mosquitoes like JD was just talking about, um, the field trial data from the experiment in Florida needs to be fully accessible and reviewed and it has not been. Um, and overall, a decision would be incomplete without the review of these questions, along with the um, really concerning unanswered questions about allergies and toxicity that JD discussed. Thanks, Malika. Thank you. Sorry, we were having an issue advancing the slides. Um, so just speaking a little bit more about regulations and the proper process that is needed. Um, regulations, no matter which department, need to be updated and modified to have um, more robust regulatory structures for responsible assessment and monitoring 
and oversight of these genetically engineered insects. So even a small release, what we would consider small of just a few thousand mosquitoes could have really big impacts because mosquitoes, as we all know, are mobile and they're not going to respect the county lines that they have been approved for or that they may be approved for. And what a mobile insect it can do and is capable of is very different from the chemicals for which the Department for Pesticide Regulation process is designed. Um, and the regulations that govern pesticides can't possibly take into account that beyond traveling, these mosquitoes will also reproduce and spread genetic material. And it's concerning because this process will set a precedent for other similar requests that are in the pipeline for agricultural genetically engineered insects. Um, and actually we know for a fact that Oxitec is currently working on creating other genetically engineered insects and that information is available on their website. Um, so the process for this needs to be more comprehensive, uh, transparent for public review and involve multiple agencies like we were mentioning before, including the Natural Resource Agency, Department of Public Health and California EPA, possibly more. Um, the process also needs to include a scientific advisory panel that is interdisciplinary. Um, so that would include like independent ecologists and entomologists and other public health experts um, to review the proposal and consider the potential environmental health and social impacts of the release of these genetically engineered mosquitoes. Um, it also needs to require public review of the Florida field trial data before um, the Department of Public, I'm sorry, Department of Pesticide Regulation makes a decision. And we need uh, real public participation that takes into account the needs of communities like yours. That means having longer than just 15 day comment periods and establishing public meetings with translation at accessible hours of the day um, and doing whatever it is that is needed to respect the community and include you all in this process. Those are really crucial for this for this process and timeline. I'm going to pass it over to Angel. Thank you, Malika, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, again, uh, my name is Angel Garcia. I am a uh, born and raised in Tulare County. And so this issue really hits home. Um, I want to start off by saying that um, Tulare County is located in the southern San Joaquin Valley in California and is home to large agricultural activity. One can often drive and see endless rows of citrus orchards, vineyards being harvested when the crops are in season. The overall population here is just over 477,000 according to the latest 2020 uh, census data. And uh, currently the largest uh, group in the county uh, is the Latinx community, which makes up 65% of the overall population in this county. This is the second highest percentage, uh, only behind Imperial County, where the Latinx uh, community there makes up around 84% uh, percent of the population um, in that county. Additionally, um, uh, Tulare County, like many counties in California's uh, Central Valley, have several uh, unincorporated communities um, scattered throughout. Generally speaking, an un a unincorporated community is often situated outside bigger cities, like in the, in the case of Tulare, County, uh, the city of Visalia, the city of Porterville, the city of Tulare, 
and these unincorporated communities um, fall under county uh, jurisdiction. But the most alarming thing about this is that um, these unincorporated communities are often burdened with uh, multiple layers of pollution, such as contaminated water, polluted air, uh, short-term and long-term pesticide exposure, and uh, not to mention that there are other um, uh, social and economic uh, uh, burdens as well, such as um, this uh, county um, has a lot of unincorporated communities where um, often have the, on average, lower median incomes and lower education attainment. And so without disregarding um, the other pressing and urgent environmental, social, economic um, uh, concerns, um, as mentioned by my colleague JD and, and, and echoed by Malika, uh, uh, the mosquitoes are, 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 I guess, fall under the pesticide um, spectrum in, in, in that they're um, being decided or the, the, the release is, is, is being looked at as we speak by the Department of Pesticide Regulation. On that issue of pesticides, that has been a constant concern for many of the communities uh, within the county, but also in up and down the state of California. Um, oftentimes in Tulare County, back to the unincorporated communities, um, these unincorporated communities are outside of the core of cities and, and, and small towns and often are surrounded by agricultural activity. Um, and if we were to sort of take a step back and look at it from the state level, um, Tulare County has consistently ranked in the top three in terms of amounts of agricultural, uh, in terms of uh, pounds of, of agricultural pesticides that are used um, when compared to other counties in the state, often only behind Kern and, and Fresno counties. Um, and so pesticides is an issue and an ongoing issue in, in Tulare County. And so this uh, potential release would be another um, unneeded, unnecessary burden for uh, members of this community. Um, and just to be more specific in terms of how alarming it is, um, more than a million pounds of cancer causing pesticides were used in Tulare County back in 2017. Uh, and if we compare this to another county like Alameda County, uh, which um, has a Latinx community of just over 22% of its overall population there, the use of cancer causing pesticides is significantly smaller. It's not even in the Tens, tens of thousands. It's only 5,301 uh, uh, pounds of cancer causing uh, agricultural pests that were used in that county in, in 2017 compared to Tulare. And so this is just to sort of give a, a very brief snapshot of uh, the seriousness of this issue, uh, especially when we're talking about communities that are already uh, being impacted negatively by economic, social, and environmental um, injustices. And so um, that I think, it, it, next slide please. And so the release of the engineered, uh, genetically engineered mosquitoes would be yet another, again, unnecessary burden for Tulare County. Not only that, but the way that the process has been thus far has been undemocratic. Uh, for starters, there's been little to no public uh, information available about the release or the potential of. And at the moment, we don't know where the release will 
take place or, or, or what the potential impacts might be. And why is this? Because the company, Oxitec, has not released the data. And so I think it's uh, really, uh, and the only thing that has really been circulating here in so far and what we've been hearing from community members is that Oxitec has already been circulating uh, potential job um, employment. And so this is just very alarming, very concerning um, as a resident of this county. We must not forget that we as a community have a right to be fully informed uh, and the right to being part of this a, a, a democratic decision-making um, uh, process, uh, processes that are involved in, 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 in this case. So I would like to just briefly mention um, that also when it came to uh, the public participation, it has been just very uh, disappointing. 15 days for public comment on something so important is simply unacceptable. There's been no outreach, no information on which to comment. A lot of this has solely been done in one language, in English, thus leaving out a great sector of, of, uh, of Spanish speaking and, and other um, languages. Um, out of this whole discussion. And at the county level, there's been a little dissemination of information um, at the, um, and really no real sort of clear direction in terms of where the public can get information or to at least find out that this is uh, a, something that's being discussed. Again, um, this is about being fully informed. This is about the right to the democratic decision-making process. And um, as mentioned earlier, this is a public health concern. Um, next slide, please. And then just to sum, sum it up, I mean, this experiment is a violation uh, of our community, uh, of community trust. And uh, this is about community consent. This is about community transparency. It's about making um, the data available to make a, an informed um, um, a consent. And again, this is uh, at the end of the day, um, the, our community, Tulare County, um, members, uh, residents, mothers, families, we all should, should have the right to decide what feels the safest and we should be informed about the uh, potential implications of what a release like this will have on families and on the different communities that are already burdened with so many economic social and environmental um, uh, injustices. Thank you. And uh, I will pass it over to my colleague now. Thanks so much, Angel. Um, to wrap up before we have the questions and the answers, I wanted to emphasize to what Angel was saying, how important participation is and that we can all be taking action to insist that we have government regulations in place and real assessments with all of the data out for public before any decision is made. We need to have a democratic and participatory process where people get to decide for themselves what happens to their bodies. Next slide. One thing that you can do is take action and send an email directly to the Department of Pesticide Regulation. 
and uh, we can put the address for this uh, directly into the chat so that you can send uh, the DPR a message. Um, it's no ge mosquitoes dot org, I believe. Um, next slide. So send DPR a message. On the Friends of the Earth website, we also have resources. There are flyers written in Spanish and English to share with communities and to share with your friends that are very short. And then there's longer ones that are a page and four pages and 20 pages, depending on how much information you would like at which scientific level. So you can find these also on Friends of the Earth's website uh, at foe.org. Next slide. We also have lots of social media for Facebook or Instagram. Um, it's really important that you are the more trusted messenger. And so tell your friends, tell your family, your neighbors, that we need to be raising our voices and saying to the California EPA and Department of Pesticide Regulation that this is not what's needed. It's unnecessary and it's unwanted. These images are shareable. So if you send the organizers at the end of this webinar an email, we can send you images. And next slide. We also have videos that are in Spanish and English that you can share with your friends and neighbors and family on social media and in emails. Next slide. So now I want to pause there and we are going to transition into our questions and uh, talk to our panelists.